the idea that he was going to be doing a sitcom, having grown out of uh, Not the Nine O'Clock News, was to me uh, the most wonderful, imaginable news. And when I saw the first picture of him, I was instantly reminded there's a very famous portrait in the National Portrait Gallery of Henry V with this preposterous pudding basin haircut, absolutely straight down. And I realized that it was going to be pretty weird and pretty out there. And the fact that Peter Cook was in the first episode was very exciting because he was the kind of comedy godfather of the time. Plus Brian Blessed, no, I don't do something, no, 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 all the time. It made it very amusing. And, no, he used to shout at no, because he couldn't remember his name. As far as I remember, that was one of the sort of running jokes. So, but I do remember a little tiny part of me being faintly disappointed that it was a bit of a mess. I don't mean it was badly written or badly performed. It wasn't either of those things. It was wonderfully performed. I think I have this theory that I call the tennis theory of comedy which sounds very pompous, and indeed is, I promise you. Uh, if you went to a tennis match or watched a tennis match on television and it was the two most athletic and graceful tennis players in history, it would be meaningless, wouldn't it, if you couldn't see the ball? And I think with The Black Adder, the first series, you couldn't really see the ball. There was no focus for the comedy. With comedy, you have to see who's speaking and who's listening, and the whole action and reaction business is like a tennis match. You've got to see the ball. You've got to be focused on it. And it was the camera was so wide and so pleased with the rolling parkland and the horses and the guards in the castle and the, the reality of it all that you lost that. Plus, it was filmed and then shown to an audience. And you can always tell somehow the audience is not there. And uh, I'm a great believer in real old-fashioned sitcom where there's an audience there. People complain about it, but it really brings it alive. And I remember there was a big issue that John Howard Davis, who controlled comedy and entertainment at the BBC at the time, didn't think there should be another Blackadder series because the first one was so expensive and relative to its expense, not that great a success. But Rowan, meanwhile, had said if there were to be one, he wouldn't write it. And Ben Elton and Richard Curtis had teamed up. Now, all the things that were wrong with Blackadder 1 in terms of you not being able to see the ball, not being able to focus on it, Ben was particularly convinced needed to be put right for Blackadder 2. And it sounds a weird way of doing it, but part of it was to shrink the whole thing, all the sets. The set which I used to be on most, next standing, you know, at the, at the right hand of Queenie, with Nursie the other side, it was virtually the size of this chair. I mean, it was tiny, and we'd be cramped there. But the great thing was, it meant it was in the middle of the, of the studio, and to its left was Blackadder's house, the half-timbered house, you know, where he would be counting beans with, Black, uh, with Baldrick or whatever. And then on the other side of, of the throne room set would be uh, a set of the week, as it were. So it might be a prison set for one where there was an execution or a boat set for the Tom Baker exploration one or whatever. It, and so the whole thing could be played in front of an audience as live, like a little playlet. And everything was concentrated. It was done with four or five cameras rather than one film camera. And you got this fabulous, fabulous concentration of comedy and everything. It became like a, a sitcom. Suddenly all the character was there and you weren't lost in a world of horses and everything. And, and as it happened, that meant it was radically cheaper, so much cheaper, that John Howard Davis took a punt that maybe it would get better. And I think it did. And, and one of the reasons was that Richard and Ben wrote scripts that were perfect for playing in front of an audience. So it was like, like doing a play every, every Sunday night when we recorded. I suppose you have to remember going back to the early 1980s, 1984. I suppose you have to remember that at the time there was much talk of comedy being a, a house divided. There was a schism, as they would say in the church, and it was between the old school of graduate comedians, um, who you can think of as John Cleese and the Monty Python and, and what had then become Not the Nine O'Clock News, Rowan and Griff and Mel had all been to, to Oxford and Cambridge, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, them and the old traditionists of variety 
posed against this so-called alternative comedy, which was the phrase used at the time, which was represented by Alexi Sale and Rick Mail and Aid Edmondson and Dawn and Jenny and Ben Elton. And Ben and Rick and Lisa Mayer had written The Young Ones, which was the great successful sitcom of the time. And it was new and weird and wild and punk and anarchic and extraordinary. And uh, so Ben was allied with those people. But Ben had also done as a writer and performer, uh, a Granada uh, series, sketch comedy, with me and Hugh and Emma Thompson, who were resolutely and uh, embarrassingly old-style Cambridge graduates. And we've got on extremely well. You can't not get on with Ben, whatever his apparent reputation may be as a bit of a yappy Jack Russell. He's the most adorable and brilliant man you could possibly hope to spend time with. And so I was utterly thrilled when he and Richard got on well enough to decide to write together because I knew that together they would make something that was absolutely of the time. They would combine the alternative spirit of Ben, if you have to put it that way, with the more Oxonian and considered and extraordinarily structured and intelligent and wise and occasionally silly humour of Richard Curtis, which has gone on, of course, to, be, to rule the world of cinema. One of the fascinating contrasts to me in the Blackadder series is the acting styles of Rick Mail and, and of Rowan Atkinson, in some ways two of the great figures of the early 80s, in the whole 80s, in fact, in, in comedy acting, and how different they are. It sort of made me think that there are, there are, there are two kinds of, of comedian. There's the one who uses his personality, like Rick Mail, the, the, the Rick character, either in, in uh, The Young Ones or as Flashheart, is like a giant version of Rick, a giant, eccentric, almost obscenely overflowering version of Rick himself. And you can see where it comes from, and it, you feel you know Rick almost because of the way he performs. With Rowan, Rowan is a quiet, studious, wise, kind, decent man that you wouldn't ever suspect was from show business or was an actor. There's nothing flamboyant about him. He's not particularly interested in show business, nothing like as much as he is in cars and the land and other things. Um, and it's as if his comedy comes out of him like a second or third, would have to be limb, like some excrescence that is not of his personality, but is like an extra, extra limb that he has that no one else has. And it's phenomenal to watch. I, I would never say one was greater than the other, I think Rowan's gift for, for the debonair, for, for suave language, was something new, which started in Blackadder 2 and got stronger in 3 and even stronger in the fourth series, that from having been a rather character in, in Blackadder, the Blackadder, the first one, uh, he, he, he became much more almost a sex symbol. He became very sort of, you know, and uh, he could, you know, he could flatter women and he could uh, use language in a dry and crisp manner, which is very different from the physical Rowan that people also know, the sort of Mr. Bean <laughs> figure, um, which is a, like a whole other thing. So in that sense, you could argue Rowan was a more complete comic actor because he has both the verbal and the physical skills. But uh, I wouldn't take anything away from him. I'd walk a mile on broken glass to see Rick at his best. It's funny that Rowan has this reputation for being the great rubber-faced clown, the great performer, which he is, but he's also a magnificent straight man. And, and in Blackadder, part of, I think, its success was that, A, his simple generosity. He was the star of the show, and, you know, television sitcoms are, are littered with the stories of people like Tony Hancock, who couldn't take Kenneth Williams getting more laughs than him. Well, Rowan was never like that. So if, if Baldrick or Percy or, or Hugh got a great laugh, Rowan was thrilled and he would help build on it by being the best straight man you could ever work to. And that sounds awfully pro -y, the best straight man you could work to. I don't even know what it means. But what I, what I think it means is, is that uh, he, can allow, he can watch, he can be still and watch characters being disgusting, like over, a, I don't know, in the trenches making a cappuccino out of mouse droppings or whatever it was. And... Um, he can, he can just watch completely, you know, sort of Buster Keaton stone-faced and then come up with a single word like, what? And it's brilliant. Uh, he's, he's a complete all-round package, that Rowan Atkinson. 
I think the first scripts that Richard and Ben presented in 1985, the, the, the Blackadder 2 scripts, the first four, as I remember, were, were simply perfect. I, I, we barely changed a word. I mean, they really were marvellous. And I guess that if flushed with the excitement of working together and doing something completely new, they really honed them and honed them and honed them. And I'm not saying they got lazier for the last two, but maybe also we were more confident with our characters by the last two, so we were adding a bit more. I know the process in three was one of quite a lot of rewriting too. And then by the time we got to Blackadder Goes Forth, the one set in the World War Trenches, then then there was an enormous amount of rewriting going on. And I don't mean that, that, that Richard and Ben had done anything wrong. They're magnificent writers, and their achievement stands as one of the great creations, I think. But um, we just needed constantly to find structural improvements. Although what people remember is working on the jokes and actually, you know, finding a, a fairly ordinary insult and, and thickening it up, plumping it, as uh, John Lloyd used to say. What we actually spent more time on was, was the logic of it. I remember Hugh rather exasperatedly saying, Have, do they actually read it back once they've written it? <laughs> which, is, which is terrible. <laughs> I'd suggest an awful enmity between, between us and Richard and Ben, and that, that wasn't there at all. But Richard and Ben weren't present at rehearsals. That's the point. Ben never even used to come to the read-throughs, I don't think. Uh, Richard probably came to the read-throughs on the Tuesday mornings, but that was it. And so it was all up to us. And I think that was deliberate. They left it up to us. Uh, it wasn't a resentment thing. I think it was just too hard for them to, you know, be there rewriting all, all the time with a pen, um, and it was easier for us to do it. But there were quite difficult moments. On the very first one we recorded, which was one which involved them being artists, and my character, General Melchett, sending them out into no-man's land to draw to draw the no man's man no man's land positions and so on. Um, oh, it must have belonged to the person who drew the map because it says mine. It's Baldrick's joke, I seem to remember. <laughs> Various things. Um, in that one, there was no real ending until I think the Saturday. Virtually, we asked the the, the, the technical crew to build a set on the very last minute, where we dressed, they dressed up as chefs, and it, it was all very, very, very you know haphazard and and very very difficult. And that process, I think, was difficult for other actors. I think for, you know, for Miranda or um, guest actors coming in, they would see us. It was particularly me and Hugh and John Lloyd really just sort of beavering away and, and Rowan popping his thing in. And uh, the others just got on with crosswords and waited for us to come up with our ridiculous thing. My least favourite memory of Blackadder is the title sequence for, for Blackadder Goes Forth. The idea was that I, as General Melchett, and Hugh and Tim, as the other two officers, would take the salute as Blackadder led his men, <laughs> i.e. Baldrick, <laughs> uh, past Baldrick playing the triangle. You may remember the sequence. It's the one that was used. But the idea was that we'd do it on horseback. I've always had a real problem with horses. And we were at the Colchester Barracks of the Royal Anglian Regiment. And the uh, colonel said, oh, I think my mount will do for you very well. Um, meet Thunderbolt. And there was this enormous horse, twice the height of me. And I got on, and actually it was, it was OK. I walked once around the parade ground, and we were there. And Tim is a very good horseman, I remember, and he was pretty adequate too. They were either side of me, and I was nice and high up on a higher horse and taller as the general. This was before we'd made any of the series, so we didn't really know how it was all going to go. And the band of the Royal Anglian Regiment strikes up the British Grenadiers, which then goes into the Blackadder theme tune, which starts with a big drum, like that. And as soon as that happened, my horse went vertical. It was like some, some painting of a rampant horse, you know. And it started to charge and go round and round the parade ground. Hugh and Tim got off their horses, not to help me, but so that they could roll on the ground, wheezing and barking with laughter at my predicament, which was horrific. I was screaming. I, thought, I was like, I was 12 foot off the ground, off solid parade ground. I was going to die. I wasn't wearing a hard hat. It was just the most appalling thing. So in the end, we tried it again, and the horse, the same thing. It was the music. Spooked it out completely. And the third time, the same. So in the end, we just stood on boxes, which was rather disappointing. So next time you see the title sequence, remember that.